If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1. And I'll, I'm going to get there here in a little bit. And I'll let you turn there. And I, I, I feel like I need to do a, a little bit of a review. Just can, so you can kind of lay hold of and grasp. You know, the series that we began last week, and as Rick said, I've been dealing with really since last November about position, you know, whether it's staying in faith, whether we're talking about our position in the secret place, or whether we're talking about our position in Christ, and now we're talking about righteousness. It's who I am. Say that with me. Righteousness, righteousness. is who I am. You know, in, in Luke chapter 21, you don't need to turn there. I just want to read this to you. And uh, in verse 36, it says, keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet and attentive and ready, praying that you have the full strength and ability to be accounted worthy to escape all these things taken together that will take place to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. What's Jesus referring to? Here he's saying, saying in the last days all these things are going to happen. So he tells, he tells us something. He tells the disciples something. So you need to be awake and you need to be alert. Why? Because there's a time that Jesus is going to be returning. And he is saying, so be awake and ready. So what? So you can be accounted worthy. So you can stand in the presence of the Son of Man. You know what? And the only thing that will make you worthy and the only thing that will cause you to stand in his presence, what we saw last week, is knowing that you are righteous. And we looked at Hebrews chapter 5 where it talked about King Melchizedek and he says, and the writer says, there's many things I want to share with you, but right now you're dull of hearing. And then it goes on and says, because you're dull of hearing, you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. So, so I really, really challenged us to, to when we enter the house of God or we enter, enter the, come into the word of God, let's not give it mental assent. Let's not be, let's not have dull hearing. What is mental assent? It means... Excuse me, I hear what's being said, but I don't receive the life-giving revelation that it brings. Because this word is life-changing. This word is life-changing. He was talking about King Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness and king of peace. And he goes, there's a lot more I want to share about this, this high priest that Jesus is, but you're dull of hearing. Because you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. I'm telling you, we need to be skillful in the word of righteousness. You need to be, you need to be a master at knowing that you're righteous. You need to master the art of knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. You are righteous. Now, religion has portrayed, no, there's no one righteous, no, not one. But it's not talking about my righteousness. We're talking about his righteousness. Well, you know, well, pastor, our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Once again, I'm not talking about my righteousness. I'm talking about his righteousness. Come on. Come on. He who knew no sin That's right. became sin That's right. so that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not become, because become lets me know, become is a, is a word for a metamorphosis, like a, like a caterpillar into a butterfly. Um, you're going to become it one day. No, but you, he took on, he became sin. That's right. Not just took on sin, he became sin. That's right. Come on. That's good. Yes. So that we could be made righteous. Yes, sir. Romans 5 says, through one man's disobedience, death reigned. But through one man's obedience... We were made righteous. Who are you? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Don't be dull of hearing that. Don't let that go over your head. And don't just say, well, I received that, Pastor. No, let that change the inside of you. Let that change your heartbeat. Let that change your faith walk. Let that change your marriage. Let it change your, your, your workplace. Let it change your business. Let it change everything about you that you are righteous, that you are royalty, that you are a part of the family. And that righteousness has said, it says it, that we talked talk about in Hebrews where that righteousness has brought us into the veil. Right. Meaning I've been brought into his presence because of that righteousness. I'm not trying to get into his presence. I am in his presence. I am seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Lay a hold of that. So you ready to learn more about righteousness? Hallelujah. Let's go. So look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, let me get there. Romans chapter 1. So Jesus said, he's coming back in the last days. You know what? We're going to be ready. Yes. We're going to be awake and alert because we know who we are. Right. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Acts isn't going to help us right now, so let's go to Romans. Maybe later in the service it will. Okay, so Romans, you're here somewhere. There you are. Hallelujah. Say thank God for the word. Hallelujah. Let's look at this. Uh, Romans 1, verse, hmm, let's see, verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's, let's have a little praise break. How about that? <laughs> Father, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you for the power of the gospel. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. Meaning this salvation is for all men everywhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed. that The gospel will never disappoint you. See, that's the word shame means. It means come to a place. The word shame means to come to a place of disappointment. So if he's unashamed, meaning the gospel will never lead me to a place of disappointment. It will always lead me to a place of victory. I'm not ashamed of it. Because I know it won't disappoint me. Now let's keep reading. Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God. See, a lot of times we stop reading with verse 16 and we shout, hey, there, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation for therein. For therein what? The gospel. Yeah. For in the gospel is righteousness. Yes. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Come on. So when we talk about the gospel, the, the gospel, the good news... The good news that Jesus preached, everything that was obtained in that gospel was to bring about righteousness. Amen. Not just bring about salvation. Not just bring about your healing. Not just bring about deliverance. But in it is righteousness. So when you talk about the gospel... The gospel is always about to lead you into places where things are made right. Yes. The gospel in the good news is about making wrong things right. Yes. See, the enemy always wants to make right things wrong. But, but the gospel is about making wrong things right. And even in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says where he, Jesus, it said, it said he died for the unrighteous, for the, for, the, for the righteous, the just for the unjust. So what? So he could bring us to God. Right. It was about making things right. The gospel is all about bringing about righteousness and bringing about right living, right being. Yes. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Yes. From faith to faith. Yeah. How did we talk about this briefly last week? How do you receive righteousness? Come on. By faith. That's right. Amen. Romans chapter 10 tells us right. that we have become righteous through faith. Yes. Amen. Righteous through faith. There's two ways that you receive righteousness by faith and receiving it yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. receiving it by faith by faith you believe and you receive yeah, that's right. yeah. Come on. you have to believe it and you have to receive it right. you have to believe it and you have to receive it Romans chapter 5 says receive the free gift of righteousness yeah. it's a free gift if, if this were righteousness, and Rick, I say, Rick, I've given you the free gift of righteousness. Take it. Yeah. See, when you receive something, it's taking it. Yeah. And it's making it your own. Yeah. It's believing that what I have in my hands is what I say it is. And it's receiving what I said it is. Yeah. So whether it comes to healing in your body, 
Whether it comes to prosperity, whether it comes to your calling, it's always going to come to pass with those two principles, believing it and receiving it. We're kind of getting off, off, off the message here for a moment, but, but for, uh, Corinthians tells us, it says, it says, I have believed, therefore have I spoken, we have believed, therefore we speak. And I've heard this said years ago where, where a lot of times we cross the bridge therefore too quickly. I have believed, therefore have I spoken. Sometimes there's a lot of speaking but not any believing. See, see, see the, the result, don't, don't try to speak what you don't believe. Allow your speaking to produce believing because then when you believe, your speaking turns from, turns from quoting something just, how do you put it this way? Thank you, Father. Your faith goes from just con- confessing something to commanding something. I have believed, therefore have I spoken. See, we can confess and confession brings, to you, brings you to the point of belief. But when you truly get to the point of belief, you don't just speak, but you command. So when we talk about righteousness, we have to receive it. We have to believe it, and we have to receive it. And Hebrews chapter 4 talks about we have a high priest over what our profession, our profession of what the high priest has done. And what has the high priest done? Made us righteous. So when you believe you receive, it's not just believe and receive, but now you're, now you're commanding, I am righteous. I am righteous. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter about feeling righteous. It's commanding because you know you are righteous. So therein is righteousness revealed from faith to faith. From faith to faith, the just... The righteous is really the same Greek word as righteous, the just. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. That's how we live. Faith is not a message. Faith is not a movement. Faith is not a fad. It's how we live. It's how we live. The righteous live from faith to faith. There's not another option. There's not another way to live. Because, you know, there's some way, sometimes you're not going to, you may not feel it. So it doesn't matter what you feel, what we live from faith to faith. Faith, look, think about faith for a moment. You you want to know, we're going to be talking about faith on Wednesday nights between now and the beginning of October. But think about it, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Freddie, give me that bottle of water. Anyone thirsty in here right now? Anyone thirsty? Rochelle, come, come up here. Some of you are afraid to raise their hands with me sometimes, not, showing, not knowing what they're going to get into. Now, now get this. let me just show you a simple example of what faith is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is substance. Now, faith is substance. See, this is substance. I'm, I'm not thinking that this could be water. I'm not, well, maybe this isn't water. I'm not really sure what this is. No, now faith is the substance. I'm, I'm holding, see, you hold substance. You carry substance. You walk with substance. And, and so when, see, there's nothing. Now, now this is Kool-Aid. You probably wish it was Kool-Aid, right? I like Kool. I like Kool-Aid, Cherry Kool-Aid. I like great Kool-Aid. I like. I like great. You want to fight? We know. No, <laughs> no that, that's that's that, that's Kool-Aid. Come on, Rochelle. Why? How can you tell? Why are you telling us water? This is water. Why is it water? It's not a Kool-Aid. It's not cold. It's not. Well, you've heard of you, you you've heard of invisible Kool-Aid. No, this hadn't been. Oh, but it hadn't been opened yet, so you know it's water. Okay. See, now, there's nothing that I could say that could talk you out of that not being water, right? right. You're confident. I'm confident. You're confident that that's water. That's right. Okay, you're going to have the water. Okay. Now, 
Now think about it, it's substance, it's, she's confident. So when we talk about now faith is the substance, well now we're saying that, substance, that, that substance is confidence. Now faith is the substance, faith is the confidence. Why? Because she's holding substance. But it's substance, but I don't have to necessarily see it to believe it. Why? Because I believe the one that promised. I believe the one that spoke it. I believe the one that, that shared it. I believe the one that gave it. You need to be seated. So when we talk about righteousness, therein is righteousness revealed from faith to faith. You have to understand that righteousness will always be accompanied by confidence. If you don't know you're righteous, you'll never be confident to stand for what's yours. The result of knowing that you're righteous is confidence. And a lot of times we go to God with sin consciousness. And we go to God with sin consciousness, you're not in faith. Maybe next week we'll, we'll talk about sin consciousness versus righteousness consciousness. Because it's, it's a big hindrance. You see, this righteousness thing is a big deal. Because therein the gospel is righteousness. Go to, go to Isaiah 32. Let, let's look at the, the fruit of righteousness. Isaiah 32, verse 17. Thank you, Father. And the work of righteousness, verse 17, and the work of righteousness shall be peace. What does righteousness do? It brings peace. When you are operating in your righteousness, you're going to operate in peace. Yeah. Amen. Because what the work of righteousness is peace. Yes. Mm-hmm. Let me say, don't just look at what I'm listening to what I'm preaching this morning as just another message. Really, the gospel hinges on this. Yeah. And everything that we have a right to in the body of Christ hinges on you coming to a place of understanding this. Yes. The work of righteousness is shall be peace. Now, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So when you're in righteousness, your righteousness is working peace. And what is the effect? What is the fruit of righteousness? Quietness and assurance forever. When you know you're righteous... It will cause you to stand in God's presence. When you know you're righteous, it will cause you to release your request to heaven. And when you know you're righteous, it will cause you to stand with assurance, stand with peace, and stand with quietness. And my people, what people? Those that are righteous, shall dwell in peaceable habitations, in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Man, what's that sound like? You see, when you step into righteousness, it's going to cause you to live in peace. When you step into righteousness, it causes you to be in a sure dwelling, established dwelling, not being moved to the left hand or the right, and quiet resting places. So the fruit of you understanding the gospel, get this, the fruit of you understanding, laying hold, and believing the gospel is going to bring about an assurance a confidence, a peaceful, a peaceable, and you're going to be established. Whew. Established, unmovable. Yes. Righteousness calls you to be un- immovable. That's right. Come on. Confidence. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. I thought Rick might preach my message this morning. But Matthew chapter 6. Like what, what Ken Copeland says, red words win. Hey, Amen. Man, right. Red words win. That's right. Come on. You know, this is righteousness. Creflo Dollar calls it 
the master key to life. Dr. Savell, in one of his books, calls righteousness the key to victory. Yeah. Kenneth Copeland calls it a force that brings change to your life. That's right. Righteousness. Everything hinges upon this righteousness. Hallelujah. You know, this is a familiar chapter. We, we, we talk about you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. You either serve one or despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon, really man-made things. Verse 25 talks about take no thought for your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or for your body, what you're going to put on. He then talks about the, how the fowls of the air, they don't sow, uh, neither do they reap, but yet our Heavenly Father takes care of them, and aren't we much better than they? And he talks about, you know, by taking thought, can you add any cubit to your stature? I've, I've thought about that. I'd just like to add another 18 inches to me. I'd love it. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could, I could think, I could worry about getting taller, and it would happen, but it just hasn't happened yet. So I'm secure in my righteousness now. I'm five foot seven and a quarter. Praise the Lord. Verse 29, and, and yet I say, and then he talks about how the, the, how the lilies of the field, how they grow, they don't toil to spend, they're not, they're not uh, you know, ooh, if I just work harder, I'm going to look prettier. <coughs> it just doesn't happen. You know, it, it just doesn't happen. <coughs> he said, but even in Solomon, all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these, O you of what little faith. Therein is righteous revealed from faith to faith. See, little faith is a result of not knowing who you are. Because righteousness is revealed from what? Faith to faith. Yes, sir. Come on. So verse 31, So therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or where, where shall we be clothed? After all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. The heavenly Father knows what you need. You know, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, it says, it says it's the Father's good pleasure That's right. to give you the kingdom. He knows what you need. Look at your neighbor and says, my Father, my father. In, heaven in heaven knows what you need. Knows what you need. Then he says this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you all these things what the things that you think you need so if I if I get priority right if I understand the right priorities then I never have to worry about my natural needs but too often we're more worried about the natural things than we are taking care of first the spiritual things Seek first the kingdom of God. In verse, the verse above this where it talks about the Gentiles seek these things. And then that verse is seek first the kingdom of God. They're two different words. They're two different Greek words. The word seek as it pertains to the Gentiles seek is the word crave or demand. Meaning, you're, meaning when, you put, when you're worrying about your natural things, you're no different than someone that doesn't have a covenant with me. When, you, when you're worrying about these natural things, you're worrying about the things that you're needing to come, then you're no different than the rest of the world. Because they're craving and they're desiring the same things that you are. But he says, but seek first. That word seek means to require. So, yeah, the Father knows you have need of these things, so what you need to require is something different than the rest of the world's requiring. As a believer and as a child of God, we require something different. There's not another religion that's like Christianity. You say, well, all, all, all ways lead, lead to God. No, they don't. Yeah, they might lead to a God, but not the right one. We have to require something. What's going to require? Need. When you require something, it's something that you need. Also, something that's a requirement is, is meaning something that is necessary. So we can look at it this way. The first thing that you need to do, the first thing that's necessary, or the first thing that's required, the first thing you need to do 
Because the Father knows you have need of these things, right? We're not, we're not negating the fact that we have needs, and the Father is not negating the fact that you have needs. He's not telling you that you don't need anything. He's just saying you need to need things in proper order. Need this thing first. Find this a necessity first. Find, this, find the, requir- the first thing as a requirement first, and then all these other things will be added unto you. Take care of this first. Say first. first. Say this with me. I gotta take care of this, I gotta take care of this. First. first. I need this I need first. first. Seek first. Require first. I need first. What's necessary first is what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, wait, wait, let's, let's, let's look at this in two different parts. I require the kingdom of God first. Can anyone tell me what the kingdom of God is? Well, let, let's, let's let the word define my question. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. It says, the kingdom of God is not. Meaning it tells us what the kingdom of God is not. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Meaning you're never going to tap in, Eric, to the kingdom of God by pursuing natural things. It'll never happen. There's not enough you can do, Eric, to earn. You'll never get enough food and drink to satisfy what you need. There's not enough money that you can obtain to satisfy what you need. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but is what? Righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know what you need? You don't need more natural things. You need righteousness, you need peace, and you need joy in the Holy Ghost. We can't tiptoe around the Holy Ghost. As he's something that isn't vital to our lives because, because according to Jesus, Jesus said, this needs to be a necessity. This needs to be something that we require. This needs to be something that we need. We need righteousness. We need peace. And we need joy in the Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. It's not a dirty word in church, all right? It, it's, it, it's something that we need. Don't let someone tell you, well, the Holy Ghost or the gifts of the Spirit have passed. No, you need these things. The church needs these things to profit, to be built up, to encourage the body of Christ. These are things that we need. These are necessities. My message this morning is not about the Holy Ghost. But it's about what do you need? The first thing you need, what we require, seek first, require the kingdom of God. You need righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and His righteousness. Why, why is the kingdom of God righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? Then He says, and seek His righteousness. Well, it, you got to understand, righteousness is what we receive from Him. He makes us righteous. Now He says, in seeking His righteousness, that's how He does things. They're two separate aspects. One is who we are, and the second is how we should live. There's two aspects of righteousness. Righteousness is how I live, but also there's fruits of righteousness, meaning how I live out of that righteousness. So what we need to do first is seek first his righteousness, his peace, his joy in the Holy Ghost, and then seek after how would he do things. You know, what would Jesus do? Because when we live and we require these things first, all those other things, all those other things, will be tracking me down. All those other things will be taken. It's not something I have to worry about. The only thing that I need, to, for the lack of a better, to worry about is seeking first his kingdom. That's the only thing I need to busy myself with is seeking first his kingdom because everything is found in his kingdom. You know, in his kingdom, as believers, we have kingdom rights. As a United States citizen, I have kingdom rights. I have kingdom rights. But so often as the body of Christ, people aren't operating and walking in their kingdom rights. Why? Because they don't know they're righteous. 
I believe it is Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 8. It says that we've been given a better covenant. Yes. Established upon better promises. See, when you know that you're righteous, you understand these better promises. We have kingdom rights. You know, I, I, if I take my passport and I go into another nation and I'm having an issue, you know what? I have the ability, I have the right to go into a U.S. embassy in another nation where there's one and I go in, show my passport, you know what? And they're going to treat me just like a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Why? Because it's who I am. I'm a United States citizen. You're, a, you're in the kingdom of heaven. And you have kingdom rights. That's right. Come on. But you know what? You have to require these kingdom rights, this righteousness, this peace, and this joy. So often, though, we don't understand, know, or realize what we have a right to. We look throughout history, you know, our, our nation founded and ratified in was it 1776. So we became a nation as in with the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And those laid out the rights of United States citizens. And we know this, especially in, in the day and age, we know the things that, 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 that's going on, not just, not just in our nation, but other nations, where the enemy tries, tries to bring division in different aspects. But in 1776, it said all men were created equal. But yet almost 85 to 95 years later, it took a, a 16th president to sign what was the Emancipation Proclamation. Come on. Come on. Ratifying and declaring and standing on the fact that all men were created equal, but yet slavery was still rampant. Slavery was still, still going throughout. At that time in 1863, there was 4.1 million slaves mm. of a nation of 31 million people. But when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, within the first several years, went from 4.1 million slaves to only 1 million slaves. Praise God for that. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln wanted to, to abolish it altogether, but he was, he, his hands were tied based on, based on the Constitution. Because we are a republic where states govern themselves, and that's how we were founded, founded as a nation. But yet, even though all humanity had the same rights, not everyone was given the same rights. It took 100 years later to 1965 by the name of Martin Luther King to stand up and say, I have a dream. So even 100 years later, there's still the mentality of slavery and not realizing that all humanity on, in this nation has... United States citizen rights. Even though there may not have been as many slaves at that time, yet still they were still treated as such. Still not having the same rights to sit on the bus where they wanted to sit or, or drink out of the right, the, the, drinking out of, out of the water fountains and things like that. Why? Because, because mindsets didn't understand that everyone had kingdom rights. Whether it's through ignorance, whatever the case is, the fact is, everyone still had kingdom rights. Yeah. Everyone still had all men are created equal. Yeah. Martin Luther King had to stand up for the rights of the African American people. That's right. And I encourage you as, as a child of God and a child of the King, you have kingdom rights. And if you're going to operate in your rights, you're going to have to stand up for your rights in the kingdom of God. Because, see, religion will try to talk you out of your rights. Religion will try to keep your rights to, well, you can only do this much. But you can't be totally free because, after all, we have to wait till we go to heaven to be. No, you're free now. You're free now. You're free. Now. We're all free now in Christ Jesus. We have kingdom rights. See, when you know your rights, there's a confidence. How could, how could Martin Luther King put his family, his life on the line? Why? He had a confidence that what he was doing was right. 
What he was doing was right. Not only was it Bible, but it was right. Now, there's a lot of people in our nation that are standing up for rights that aren't biblical. Don't try to, don't try to connect the, the, the rights to slaves to some of the rights that are trying to push today. That, that they're not the same. They're not the same. So we have to understand that, that when I know my rights, that gives me confidence. It doesn't matter if they stone me, they beat me, they throw things at me. That's why the disciples could lay their life on the line. That's why they, they, could, they could totally surrender their lives because they knew that God was going to take care of them even unto death. Even if, even if they died, it didn't matter why, because they were confident in who they were in Christ. See, you have to know, I mean, listen, you, you have to know that you have a right to be healed. You have a right to be prosperous. You have a right to wisdom. You have a right to joy. You have a right to a strong marriage. You have a right to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. You have a right to be above and not beneath. You have a right. You have a right to wisdom. You have a right to be rich. You have a right to be wealthy. You have a right to fulfill the call in your life. You have a right to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You have a right to come boldly to the throne. You have rights in the body of Christ. You have rights. But until you know you're righteous, you'll never stand on your rights. Because the effect of righteousness is peace. The effect of righteousness is assurance. So when you know your rights... You'll stand in the midst of your sickness, the disease, whatever it is, and it doesn't matter, and you'll stand in those rights. Well, what if this doesn't, what, it doesn't matter, I'm going to stand in my rights. What if something happens to you, it doesn't matter, I'm going to stand in, it doesn't change my rights. As, as Christians in this nation, there could be a possibility one day our rights as, as being able to free speech, talking about Jesus, could be taken away as it is in, in, in so many nations across the world. But will that change anything? Will that change what I speak? No. Why? Because I know my rights in the kingdom of God. You know what? My rights in the kingdom of God far outweigh my rights in the United States of America. The kingdom of God is not based on a democracy. It's based on him being the king and me surrendering to the king. So I, re so I receive what? His righteousness. I receive his righteousness. Thank you, Father. Go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Thank you, Father. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Familiar story. And a certain man had two sons. Verse 11. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. You know, there were two sons. But the younger said, I want what's mine. The son realized he had rights. Now, some of you heard me preach on this before. What he did was so negative in the Jewish mindset. This, this wasn't correct of him. This wasn't right of him. Because to ask for your father, your inheritance before your father's dead is to say, you no longer exist to me, dad. But yet the father gave him what he asked for. Thank you, Father. Help me to convey this. And we know it went out and he devoured it all in his riotous living. He spent it on prostitutes, spent it on partying, spent it on all sorts of things. And he comes back to a place where he's in the pigsty. And the only thing he's able to eat are the cobs and the same things that the pigs are eating. You see, the Father will let you do whatever you want to do. But yet, His righteousness is always available. Yes. See, one of the amazing inheritances that we've been given as a body of Christ is grace. 
but a lot of people will take the message of grace and try to devour it in righteous living. But grace was always meant to sustain you to live above the rest of the world, not like the rest of the world. Because grace, the free gift of grace, was to bring you to a place of rightness, not keep you in a place of wrongness. So when he got to this place and he was broken, he got to this place where he had ran out of options, and he got to this place where he was like, hey, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. Maybe, maybe if I just go back, I can, you know, I, you know a lot of times that we, try to do, we try to figure it out in our head, right? You know, I, I, would, I would get in trouble with my parents or I knew I did something wrong and I'd always try to come, I'd come up with a story before I ever saw mom and dad because you know, well, it was so-and-so or it was, you know, I've got this thing. Well, if I just come back and, well, I'll just be a servant, then everything, you know, I just, I, I don't need to be a son. I, you know what? I'll just be like the rest be, uh, for the servants because, you know, at least they're getting more than what I'm getting. So grateful for the Father's love. And I'm so grateful that he still has arms that will extend grace, even to the pigsty. So, Jesus, so, so the man got up and he started home on his journey. And, and it says, the father's seeing him a great way off. See, the father's always looking to extend his grace to you and to me. And it says, when he saw him a great way off, the father ran, which is another thing that wouldn't happen in Jewish tradition. Because they would wear tunics and it would be inappropriate for a father, especially a wealthy father, to show his legs. So him to to the expense of everyone watching him, man, he runs to his son, throws his arms around his neck, hugs him and receives him. Hallelujah. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your own hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, love, not just a love that sees, but a love that acts. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have now, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. Meaning I no longer have access to what my inheritance is. But the father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. The father said, put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger. What does that mean? He put a robe on him. He put a robe of righteousness on him. See, he didn't think he was worth it, and he didn't think he no longer had rights. I'll just be one of your servants. But what did he do? He, he said, servants, go get a robe. Put it on him. That robe represent, represented that, you know what? I once again have rights. Jesus died on the cross for you and I. He looked at Jesus, his son, or his servant, as a son, and said, provide a robe for them. The robe that Adam lost, place it on him. Put a ring on his finger. What does that mean? Authority. We're going to get into authority in another session as well. And even you see the, the other son, the son, other son, gets upset and said, said, Father, I, I'm not, I can't go into that party. And that's another wrong thing because, because the son should have been one, the one throwing the party. That's what the older son did. And then the, for the father to leave the party, to come out, that's even another no-no in Jewish tradition. But the father came out and said, what's going on? He goes, how can you do this? He, he's, he's devoured everything. See, the one, was, the one came to a place where he was unrighteous, and the other one was religious. But either one of them are both unrighteous. Yeah. 
The father goes, he goes, he goes, God, he, Father, you've never done any of these things for me. You haven't, you haven't done any of these things for me. You haven't done all these things. You haven't killed the fatted calf for me. And the father said, man, everything that I have is yours. You're worried about a fatted calf when I, you have everything that I possess. You see, unrighteousness will keep you from possessing your rights. See, we're no longer, according to Galatians 4, we're no longer servants, but we're sons. Better yet, we're sons that choose to serve. But a son has to recognize his rights. Therein is righteousness revealed from faith to faith. Righteousness is who I am. When I know I'm righteous, it brings about confidence to possess what's mine. And like that young man, that young son that fell away, to receive what the Father's given me. We have to receive what the Father's given, and we also have to stand for what the Father's already given. Both sons are descriptions of unrighteousness. Some of you may have been serving God for 30, 40 years and, and be like, yeah, you know, but yet God, I'm still living, I'm still, no. You have everything, you have access to everything I have. Yes. You don't need to beg God for it. Come on. Believe it and receive it. Amen. Go to Isaiah 61 and I'll close with this. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord, uh, the Lord anointed me to preach the gospel unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, open of the prison to them that are bound. Sounds familiar, right? Yes. Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 4, 8, Jesus saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yes. So this is Jesus this is what Jesus prophesied after he was baptized and came out of the wilderness. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So why the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus to declare the good news. Remember, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus said, the anointing is on me to preach what the gospel to the poor, Right? So here he's telling us the gospel and it's to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. This is what the gospel is all about. Now listen, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. You got ashes in your life? Have, have, have things died in your life? The gospel is all about making something beautiful out of it. The oil of joy for mourning you. Are you mourning this morning? The gospel is all about bringing you joy. Now, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Are you heavy this morning? Well, because of the gospel, you have a right to praise. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The gospel and what Jesus preached. I, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also because that's why him sent. Why Jesus preached and what he preached was all so you and I could be trees of righteousness. What is a tree? It's something that's established. It's something that's immovable. It's something that can't be shaken. So if you don't know you're righteous, it's because you don't know the gospel. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. We are trees of righteousness, what so he can be glorified. Verse 7, get this. I'm talking about rights, right? For your shame, you shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Man, if you're righteous, you need to lay hold of this. For your shame, you shall have double. Say double. double. For confusion, you shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess. You want to possess the double? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Only some of you do. Therefore. 
Therefore, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Who's them? The righteous. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. See, we're trees of righteousness, and you need to understand, we are the seed. When you're righteous, you realize you're the seed that's blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He hath clothed me with a garment of salvation, and He's covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments, and as a bride adorn herself for her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her blood, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. I'm telling you, the gospel is all about being trees of righteousness. We are the seed. The righteous are the seed that Him blessed and will spring forth into all the nations. Meaning this righteousness isn't about me keeping it for my life so my life can be blessed. This righteousness that I've received is so it can spring forth and touch the nations. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's who I am. I have a robe of righteousness. I have a victorious life because I'm righteous. I have rights. I am healed. I am delivered. I'm set free. I have wisdom. I possess all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. I have wisdom in every situation. I come behind in no gift. I'm enriched in all things. I have the joy of the Lord. I'm anointed. I'm empowered. I'm equipped. The power of God is flowing in my life. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Holy Ghost fills me. Is overflowing out of me. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Something I learned from Miss Carolyn, she used to talk about praying for an hour. And she would talk about, you know, praying the names of God. And I remember her talking about, you know, Jehovah Sidkenu, which you can see that in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. And talks about Jehovah Sidkenu, our righteousness. And, and I remember writing out this, this, a prayer, and, I, and, I, and I, I would confess this every day. I would say, he, you know, he, he is Jehovah Makedesh. He is my sanctifier. He has set me out of the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of light. He is, he is Jehovah Sidkenu. He is my righteous. I have a right to be healed. I have a right to be whole. I have a right to wisdom. Everything I have need of, I have a right to. It's mine. I receive it. Amen. He is Jehovah. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. I have peace. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Hallelujah. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is my healer. I am healed, spirit, soul, and body. He sent His Word and healed me and delivered me from all my destruction. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. He is your righteousness. Stand in your rights. Before anything, wherever you're at in your life right now, whatever you're going through, (coughs) seek first, require first, need first his righteousness, his peace, his joy. Because all those other things that you have need of. Get your mind off your sickness. Get your mind off the report. Some of the biggest downfalls that I've seen in people is, how did I let this in? Why did I receive this? How come I'm walking through this? It doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter how, just know where healing comes from. You don't need to find out what devil's behind it all the time. You just need to know where deliverance comes from, know where healing comes from. Every knee bows to the name of Jesus. But a lot of times we feel like we have to do all these natural things 
because we don't value our righteousness. Because everything stops. Heaven listens to a man. Hmm. Thank you, Father. The fervent prayer. The fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It didn't say much praying avails much. It says the fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power. I'm getting ahead of myself in future weeks. But, mm. Oh, Father, we receive this word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cassie, can you, just, just for a moment, I know we're taking a little bit of time, can you and Joseph go up? I, if you could just, just play some of No Striving. Or if you want to, you want to, Joseph or you, or just you, it's, it's okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Everyone stand to your feet. During worship, I just had, a, I felt like this song was to minister to some people. Remember, we believe we receive. It's the gift of righteousness. Thank you, Father. Mm. By faith. It's not, it's not working for it. If we had to work for our righteousness, if we had to work for our salvation, Jesus would have never had to come. Never had to come. You believe it and you receive it. As it pertains to your healing, Get before God. Hear, hear from Him what He's telling you to do. It's not about striving to earn healing. It's not a striving to earn prosperity. It's believing and receiving. In future weeks, we'll do that as well as, well as obedience. not striving hallelujah thank you Jesus oh, there is no striving there is no striving for your love freely you have given Freely you have given for us. There is no, there is no striving. Holy Spirit, work in this place. There is no striving for your love. He forgives us this morning, receive it. Freely you have given. Been away from God to receive Him. Freely you have given to us. No, there is no striving. Thank you, Father. There is no striving for your love. Freely you have given. Freely you have given to us. You have made us yours. You have called us daughters and sons. <laughs> this is who you i <laughs> 
sons and you made us according to Ephesians citizens of heaven so fathers abide of believers we receive our righteousness we receive our rights we stand in our rights in Jesus name give him a shout of praise if you receive it this hallelujah. hallelujah thank you father Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We receive our healing. We receive our righteousness. We receive your goodness. We receive our victory. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. 